You got the question? Welcome, welcome again. I'm Gareth A. Davis. It's chat. It's boxing chat show number four with Dan Raphael. It's VE Day in the UK. I've had a little tipple already. Um, all my neighbours were having a complete street party. It's a bit of a, a lockdown breakout today. Everyone's in their driveways. Everyone's sharing drinks and food. It's, I'm delighted to say Dan Raphael joins me again. How are you, Dan? You look I'm like good, you're Dan. in the MGM Grand. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, it does. We put up a little virtual background just to make things interesting. I just saw your virtual son in the background as well. Yeah, he wanted to see what's going on, you know. He's the most curious seven-year-old in the world. He is, and he was the most curious six-year-old, and I'm sure he'll be the most curious eight-year-old. <laughs> Brilliant. How have you been the last four or five days? I've been good. Just doing my, you know, doing our thing, staying busy, you know, doing videos with you. Been, we've been working on the new show that we talked about last week, the Impact Boxing Show that premieres Friday night. I've been uh, working on some stories for our good pal Rick Reno over at Boxing Scene and, uh, you know, just kind of trying to relax a little bit and keeping busy with that and paying attention to what's going on in boxing, talking to a bunch of people throughout the business, uh, like I'm sure you have. And, uh, and, uh, and now it's supposedly the weekend, but it's really no different, I guess, at this point than every other day of the week. What's weird is with this first Impact show, you've almost got a TV exclusive because it's with Leonard Ellaby. You and I both know him very well. I've probably known him 25 years. Leonard's never really put himself out there and exposed himself in a way outside our group. So you've got an exclusive of sorts getting well, him on I mean, TV for the first time. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's an exclusive. I mean, he obviously does a lot of uh, interviews and such. Uh, during the big fight weeks for the events that uh, Mayweather Promotions is involved with. But uh, like you said, I've known Leonard for a long time. I've known him for about 20 years. And, uh, you know, we've certainly had our ups and downs, but we've always maintained a very uh, friendly and professional relationship, very cordial. I like Leonard. And, uh, you know, he was a terrific guest. He answered all kinds of questions. We discussed, uh, you know, the prospect of a Floyd Mayweather comeback, the prospect of Floyd Mayweather, as, he, as Mayweather has stated about the possibility of becoming a trainer, about the plans for some of their younger fighters and when uh, they're able to get back to boxing and what their plans are. Um, and, and, you know, some of, a lot of people know Leonard just as a guy, um, you know, who's involved in Floyd Mayweather's business. They see him in the press conferences, maybe before Mayweather promotions existed, they would see Leonard as one of the guys in Floyd Mayweather's corner or walking into the ring with him. People don't really know the story of how he got involved in boxing. And, you know, we talked about that for a bit uh, at his relationship uh, uh, with the Mayweather family and, and how he became acquainted with them. So, you know, you know, I think it was a, boxing fans, if they get a chance to watch it, will uh, hopefully enjoy it and, and learn a few things. The funny thing is you talk about comebacks, all right, because it's going to be one of the themes of today. Dan and I are going to talk about fight week in Vegas probably in a couple of, probably early next week, because um, people seem quite excited about that. You talk about comebacks. How realistic? We've covered the three Mayweather comebacks, the significant ones, yeah. Mm -hmm, sure. Um, how, how realistic is it for Floyd to come back again? I mean, I think if he decides that he wants to come back, it's very and realistic. And who? And who? Well, who he would fight, that, you know, who the heck knows? I mean, you know, there's always the prospect uh, that they dangle out there of doing a rematch with Manny Pacquiao. It's the fight that Pacquiao said he wants. Would we go to that? You and I would go, wouldn't we? Yeah, of course. Be. Yeah. Because it's, you know, whatever the situation is, they're the two biggest names of the era. Uh, and they've been the two pound-for-pound -pound kings for the era. And uh, whatever you thought about the way the first fight happened in the ring. It obviously wasn't the most compelling fight, but they're two of the biggest and most compelling fighters and personalities that we've seen, not just in the time that Garrett, that you and I have been involved in covering boxing, but maybe in the entire history of boxing. I mean, they're, they're on that level. So yeah, of course, but I'm, I wouldn't say I would be excited to see that matchup necessarily. I mean, I think we saw what we saw. Uh, if we thought the fight occurred a couple years too late when they fought in 2015, now here we are in 2020. Imagine how, uh, how late it would be. Yeah, but it's still historically significant. That's the point. Yeah, no doubt. If Floyd wants to come back, which, you know, I'm still skeptical of him actually doing it, but if he does, so be it. Uh, certainly that would be a fight that they could talk about because it's a fight that, that Pacquiao said he wants. And then Floyd could also go the route where, you know, it could be some other MMA fighter. It could be another McGregor fight. You know, maybe he gives a chance to a younger fighter or another aging veteran. You know, Floyd Mayweather's world we live in it, I guess, at this point. So it's been a week of comeback talk, okay? So let me run through them. Okay. Evander Holyfield's looking in good shape. Black and white videos. He's doing the road work. Mike Tyson's in the gym with Rafael Cordero at MMA Kings, um, one of the great MMA coaches. Um, 
delighting people. Tens of millions of views of Mike throwing, you know, the, the, the left, the, the, the left, right, two shots to the body, ducking under the counter, ending with the right cross. Do you know what I mean? Like brutal. I've, look, I've seen the video. How realistic. It's not realistic. And I, I love Tyson. I love Holyfield. Uh, you know, I've gotten to know them over the years. I enjoyed covering lots of, of, you know, a good portion of their careers. But people have to remember, first of all, seeing Mike, Mike Tyson and Evander when they want to be, they still can put forth, you know, elements of the tremendous athleticism that led to the, to the great careers that they had. But it's but 20 that, years ago. It's that was Tyson in a video that was like 15 seconds. Yeah. So I'm not sure you can do that for three minutes, much more. <laughs> you know, three, four rounds, five rounds, whatever it would take. So again, I have, I'm, not, I'm not saying bad about either Tyson or about Holyfield. And I have nothing but, you know, good thoughts for them and their futures and their families and all that. However, people should think back to what they looked like in their, in their fights that were at the end of their career when everybody was like, these guys are great former champions, but they're shot to bits. And now they're, you know, many, many more years older. Um, and I, I've been, I was with Evander Holyfield in person for uh, quite a while. Uh, you know, we spent like, a, you know, probably two hours, you know, in the press room uh, at the end of last year, or I forget if it was an earlier this year or whatever, he was at one of the fights and I got a chance to talk to him, met his son, uh, Evan, who is now uh, embarking on a professional boxing career. He's like, you know. That Mike's gone to see as well, do you remember? Mike yeah, Tyson's I mean, gone to see him box, isn't he, as an amateur? Exactly. With the man still looks in good shape and he's yeah. still, he's still, if you, you know, put your arm around him or, you know, slap him on the back. He still feels strong like an athlete, still feels sturdy. But again, there's a big difference between that as just a normal person day to day than actually getting into the boxing ring and doing an actual fight. Could they return for some sort of exhibition, maybe raise money for a charitable cause, do like two rounds? Do a bit of fake ear, do a bit of fake end of the ear falling off, all that. But that could raise money for charity. Sure. At the I moment, see that. if that I happened, Dan, if that happened in pandemic, and they put it on YouTube and they said it was to raise money for different charity organizations. I think it would make a lot of money and I think we'd enjoy it. And I'd certainly write about it and publicize it. For sure. It. But there's a difference between doing something like that and trying yeah. to have an actual uh, official sanctioned fight for a length of time under actual boxing rules and et cetera. I, I just don't see that happening. I mean, there's the rumors that Tyson's going to go to the bare knuckle fighting championships and, you know, fight Shannon Briggs. I mean, you know, come on, who needs that? Who wins that in bare knuckle, though? I would probably pick Briggs just because he's bought more recently and he's younger. And No, I think Tyson would knock him out quickly. I mean... But he's got to do it within 90 seconds. Look, um, John Fury last night here in the UK, he's ranting and he's raving at the guy Mickey Theo is supposed to be fighting him, suddenly calls out Mike Tyson. I mean, I mean, we know the world's gone mad at the moment, but... The world gone mad. Everybody's stuck inside. They want to make some noise. I mean, you know. Who John, wins out of you and Kevin Ioli? If what? Like mono a mono, me and Kevin? I kick his ass. What? Who wins out of me and you? I kick your ass. No, I kick your ass. <laughs> You're lucky I like you. <laughs> Look, the, the, it's, I'm just kidding, Kevin. I'm just kidding. It'll be a draw. Yeah. Hey, 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 Dan. I'm not yeah. fucking kidding, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. okay. No, but listen, listen. You know me and you. We hug it out when we see. Oh you. yeah, of course. Um, it is. <laughs> it is entertaining. <laughs> it it's is entertaining. It's probably more entertaining to talk about and and yeah, out and 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 break down and all that. But actually seeing it, you know. You know, a John Fury, uh, a Tyson and a Briggs, uh, you know, a Vander in a real fight or something like that. I, I mean, you know, that shit. If people want to see that, then I would suggest, you know, go on YouTube and watch some of their all-time great matches and some of the epic fights that we've seen them involved in. Enjoy those because they're readily available. I completely agree. Look at them in their pomp. Look yeah. at them what they really were. And that's what it's been seeing, that, like you say, that 14, 15-second retro of Mike Tyson. It's a reminder of how brilliantly he swiveled his hips, how he had control of so many things, how he was different to everyone else. And he had beautiful and brutality. And if he wants to get into, you know, better conditioning by working out in the boxing gym. With All good. Trainer, you know, there's nothing wrong with that either. But again, there's exactly. a... While getting very stoned, clearly, with his marijuana farm, you know? Exactly. So <laughs> I don't know if Mike could pass a drug test these days. <laughs> <laughs> so it's two quite 
there are intrinsic issues in boxing that have come up this week. There's three more things, I, you know, kind of intrinsic that I want to talk to you about. Talking about spitting in boxing, um, judges uh, judging from remote, which is something our friend Mauricio Suleiman has brought up with the World Boxing Council. And thirdly, there's three UFC events in the next eight days in Jacksonville, Florida, starting with tomorrow night. I've got my own views on that, but I want you to talk to me about it in terms of, not that it's UFC or MMA compared to boxing, but is it the right time? So first of all, spitting. Now, spitting, I played sport once, cricket and rugby, martial arts. When I bowled a ball like a baseball chucker, I spat every time I, before I ran up. It was just a part of the rhythm. Footballers spit. Boxers clear their noses during a fight. They spit into a bucket. They clear, they take some water and spit into a bucket. It's arisen this week that, and, and Robert Smith, the secretary, the general secretary of the British Boxing Board of Control rang me after the story had gone out at pains to point out, we haven't outlawed spitting. We will find a sealed container that boxers can spit into at the end of a round. We will encourage them not to clear their noses. Um, but the, the idea of spray and sweat and blood and saliva is a very important thing in our sport, isn't it, right now, because of the coronavirus. If you're going to have a problem with an element of spitting or clearing your nose as a boxer, and you think that it might be a problem, to me, it's obviously too soon to start fighting again. So wait for the wait for the vaccine. How are you gonna How are you gonna avoid that? I mean, that's just a natural inclination for, for an athlete that's you know using up energy and is trying to breathe. And you know, first of all, they get hit in the nose. You're gonna want. You can't regulate that. I don't want to hear about a sealed container. And I'm, I'm, we're in here. We're in here, aren't we? You're in here with your opponent. You know, it's, it's it's absolutely insane. So if you if you have if you think there's a problem with that and you're at that level of minutia of sealed, can, then don't do any fights, because if you can't do it freely, then what's yeah, the point? I completely you know, agree. Respect for the people that are trying to make it safer and, and less contagious and all that kind of business. you got a lot more problems to deal with if you're worried about somebody, you know, spitting on the canvas or spitting in a bucket or, I agree. or something like that in the, in the ring. And, you know, in the course of the round, forget about what goes on in the corner, whether you're spitting. Like you said, the fighters are in close, their heads are touching, they're, they're hitting each other, their faces are touching, the referee is... The cheat. You're exchanging sweat and saliva. It's just, it's, There's it's, no it's way so you can avoid it. Yeah, so yeah. I, I don't even give that credence. You know, an athlete is going to spit in boxing or any other sport, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. And if you don't want them to spit, then don't have the sport uh, being played or being, being uh, fought or having taken place at this point. So it's interesting that you say that. It's kind of like you either accept it and mentally, emotionally, physically deal with it, or you say, you know what, I'm going to wait for the coronavirus to have a, a vaccine, I'm going to be tested, and I'll come back in, in all in good time. I mean, so, I'm, all, I'm all for having, having it being done in the, you know, bringing back these uh, sports, boxing and otherwise, in the safest manner possible, even if it means no audience uh, in, in your field of play, in your stadium, in your arena. But once the game starts or the fight starts or the activity starts, you got to do it under the same rules and regulations you've always done it. You, you can't, uh, you know, change the way that these athletes conduct themselves in any meaningful way. I mean, that's just, it's just making, it makes no sense to me. Yeah, it's the same with us as well. It's in terms of there's no point us coming back for these small hall shows that are five fights, 10 rounds or under that they're going to do behind closed doors. Because we're, if we're carrying it, we're bringing it to the event. There's no I'm point calling us. No, but Dan, the only way we're going to be—they're going to have to test people. So yeah, we're and we're going to have to sit in little cubicles with perspex, um, you know, kind of like walls, and we're going to have to do the press conference with that. And you know, that doesn't work for us because when mm. we get in, we get down and dirty. Do you know that? I listen. I know. I've been ringside for lots of fights and lots of fight weeks, and uh, you know, you, you, you know, you can make certain adjustments in how you conduct your business, but. Certain things are just that you have to do. So I don't, I don't expect there to be media present at any of these uh, initial fights anyway, you know, for, for a little while. And I, I, would, I would think that the promoters or, or the people involved with an event, when, when the fights do happen, if it's a big enough event where there's, it's going to warrant like any kind of notable media coverage, 
you know, they'll probably have, instead of a press conference after the fight, they'll have maybe a teleconference after the fight. Yeah. Or Paul will be behind a, a perspex screen. Yeah, exactly. So I you mean, know, you'll still be able to I don't what... see it, genuinely, Dan. I don't see, you know, we, we do a lot of travel, you and I, and, and this is a, at this age in our lives, and you're the age of your son, you know, I have a grandson, I've had, you know, I've had these heart issues recently. It's probably done us a little bit of good to have a rest, you know, because we've yeah, been no, on the road. Right, but I'm, good, I'm ready to go back on the road. Yeah, no, me too. Don't get me wrong. I'm a little bit stir crazy. <laughs> but when... Today, today is, today, it's either today or yesterday, two months since I was at my last fight, which was when Robert has fought Adam Konaski yeah. in New York at the Barclays Center. And I was thinking to myself, since I covered, we talked about it, I think last time we did one of these, about uh, the April 29th, 2000 event at Madison Square Garden with Lennox Lewis, Michael Grant, Arturo Gatti, Klitschko. Um, as you know, that was my first event for USA Today. So when I first became the national writer for that publication. And ever since that fight, that was 20 years ago, last month, I have never gone eight weeks ever without going to an event. I know. So have now been on eight weeks with no fight. That's like, I'd have to like, I don't even know how, I couldn't even tell you how. I might have, maybe I might have went five weeks without a fight, maybe six, never eight in 20 years. Yeah, I'm seven, I'm seven weeks and seven and a half weeks. And I was weirdly at a Bellator event in Connecticut, the Mohegan Sun, that was canceled four hours before it was due to take place. And Luckily, because I was working TV and it was being broadcast back to Sky, and I was doing a little segment about being in an arena with no audience, right. I was really excited about it, but it was cancelled four hours before. So mm -hmm. my last event was an event cancelled four hours before it was due to take place. So um, I want to move on to Mauricio Suleiman had a Zoom call. I don't know why you weren't on it earlier in the week. You're probably filming. But I was on it with many others. Lance Pugmire, our great friend, and others included. No, they invited me to join. I just was not able to do it at that moment. No, no, I, I know. I know you'd have been on it. Um, but Mauricio brought up reducing the numbers at ringside. And there were a couple of judges on this call. And their attitude concerned me because they've never judged a fight as we have off TV. Because in our roles, we might... People don't know this. We'll watch an event at another event because we're covering both. Yeah? Well, so, not, not simultaneously, though. No, no, but what I, no, no, hang on. What, let me clarify. Yeah. If there's an event in the UK and I'm in Vegas, I filed in the afternoon to my newspaper because that's real time and it goes in the newspaper, mm -hmm. but I've watched it off TV. But people but, are like, like The fight happens because of the time difference. So exactly. But, in the UK, you're but, Dan, your but Dan, the people that have seen that live, if it's a close fight, have sometimes seen a different fight to the one I've been watching. And when, and when Mauricio brought up this week, judges judging from remote on TV, I, I, it, it brought up a whole new algorithm for how they will be looking at a fight differently to being live. I think that, again, Mauricio has become a good friend of mine. I have a lot of respect for him. We have a lot of good times together. But as you know, and we've talked about before, we don't always agree on things. So to me, the notion of remote judging is like 100 billion times worse than the franchise champion. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Let it me is just, hang on. Let me just laugh out loud at that because that is really, really fucking funny. It's awful. <laughs> And they're trying to lessen whatever problems may occur and reduce the number of people at the ring area for these events under these closed door circumstances. If you're going to eliminate people at ringside, the judges are not them, period. That's the whole point. Now, yes, you and I as, as a journalist or, you know, an average fan watching it on television and, and people around the world viewing it on a, on, a, on a television or their laptop or, you know, their phone or whatever, you know, that they're the spectator. And they can have their opinion the same way if we're watching a basketball game or whatever. The whole purpose, it's like, it would be like having an umpire in baseball, you know, calling balls and strikes while watching on television instead of being behind home plate, you know, being in the dugout watching it on a, on a camera. It's just, the whole purpose is you're there to actually judge the event as it's. Can I say why as well, Dan? 
you can yeah. hear noises, you Absolutely. can hear the emotions. It, this is what people don't realize. This is a really important thing in our chat. You and I get the privilege of being feet from the ring. You can hear the noise. It's not even just the sound, Gareth. It's you can feel the energy of the impact of exactly and the footwork, the expressions. There's a nuance that the people don't know this who've done as much. I'm not trying to blow my trumpet here because you get all these comments yeah, on Twitter. By the way, these are a thousand dollar glasses to the guy <laughs> that keeps saying I've got cheap glasses. Yeah, I'm diabetic. I've had a heart attack. I need these because they're very focal. They're really fucking expensive. All right, enough with your glasses. Let's get back but, to the judging. But, but the, what, what happens is it's the same thing. People laugh when I say it. I sniff and I scent and I get nuance and energy from fighters during a fight week when I'm there. And sometimes I know who's going to win because I've sniffed something unusual about a fighter. You know exactly what I mean. I know. Here's the thing I would say to those folks that, that watch on TV and why it is different when you're in the ring. And I'm the first to admit that I have watched fights on television after being ringside, and sometimes there's a difference in how you see it. Exactly. How I you agree. hear it. Now, we don't have the when, – when we watch on TV, unless you turn the sound down, you hear what the commentators are saying about the matchup. When we're at ringside, we're not hearing the commentators. Uh, we don't have access to the CompuBox stats during the fight like, like you do if you're watching on television. Not that they're the reason to judge. but So those things are shut out. But here's the main thing. You can watch it on TV, you see a guy land a shot. And I can tell you that one of the, not one of, the main criteria in professional boxing to judging is, you know, clean, effective punching. Who's doing the damage? Yeah. I'm sitting at ringside and I'm six feet away from the ring or eight feet away from the ring. You can feel the impact of certain punches on guys being a guy that might be a lighter puncher. So if I see that guy and he's maybe not landing as many punches, but they're doing the damage and they're physically causing damage to this dude, I'm more likely to favor that guy. You cannot feel that or see that or get a feel for that in any meaningful way just watching at a video camera. So to me, you know, I'm all for having an open dialogue about all kinds of ideas of how to improve things, how to get things done if there are fights behind closed doors and that sort of thing. But taking the judges away from ringside to me is probably the worst idea of all of them. Uh, listen, completely agree. It's three people. It's a guy um, going around collecting their scores, the supervisors we call them. Four people that absolutely fucking need to be there. Now, hang on a minute. Universally, I'm a better scorer of fights than you. We won't get into that right now. You're allowed your answer. Um, <laughs> but, but I remember, I'm going to move on to another side. I completely agree with you, mate. And, and you know what? And he will remain nameless. But when I was on that Zoom conference with Mauricio the other night, I was doing my fucking nut when the judge that was on was going, yeah, it'll be just the same. I'm thinking, no, this worries me. Judges at ringside, end of. Now, you and I were in... Uh, By the way, just before you go any further, yeah, it's all well and good for the WBC or any other sanctioning body to have that opinion, to maybe want to give it a test, a try. But in the end, at least in America anyway, the WBC has zero say-so in the matter. The way that the fights will be conducted behind closed doors is 100% up to the local commission in that, in that jurisdiction, whether it's the Nevada Commission, the New York Commission, the California Commission you know, a tribal commission on an Indian casino, yeah. whatever. Uh, the, the sanctioning body will have absolutely zero input into how the fight is regulated. Absolutely right. Listen, you remember, I was about telling this story when uh, Mick Connell, uh, Connell had made his uh, um, debut for top rank. You'll remember this. Now, yeah, I, yeah. I know Conor McGregor. And obviously, I was like six inches away from him when he burst in before, just before Mick Connell and fought. And listen... We're all the fucking boxing guy. You're the fucking boxing guy. Where is he? You're the fucking... I'm taking over boxing. All that. It's not a great Irish accent. We were there that yeah, night. I huh? I said that accent was pretty bad. Uh, hey, listen, can you do it any better? No, but I'm not trying. I'm not making a fool of myself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm the fucking boxing. I'm taking over fucking boxing. And to be fair to him... He made the big, second biggest grossing boxing fight in the history of our 150-year sport. Um, I want to talk to you finally about UFC. I'm, it's great to see you so well. Listen, it has been a street party here today, and it's been going for five hours. It's, we're still in the morning here, yeah, so... You know, I know, but I can't it's help. It's five o'clock somewhere. What's for you know? dinner? 
Oh, you know, we, we're not going to go through this again. It's TV. No, you sent me an email with dinner with a dinner menu the other day. Oh no, I said after the fact. You always ask me what's for dinner on the day that we talk. What's for dinner tonight with a beautiful with your beautiful wife? I have no idea. You are you are a slouch. Just don't know. So you better find out for the show five. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> this Saturday, and you know I cover MMA as well, obviously, yes. of course, for the last fifteen years. Wednesday and Saturday, UFC doing three events, Jacksonville, Florida. The lockdown's been relaxed there. They reckon they're doing 400 deep down the nose, four inch COVID swab tests for each of the three events. Big risk, big reward. I was nervous about it. I hope no one gets ill from it. I hope no one catches anything, but in a way I hope it's a success because it will encourage our boxing promoters. Um, Bob Arum said it's outlandish cowboy behavior. Oscar De La Hoya said, good on you, Dana. If you can make it work, make it work. It is risk and reward. I'll be covering it tomorrow night. I hope everyone's safe. I think it may help us if it's successful. Well, I think every single boxing promoter that's hoping also to get back to business they're all going to be, not, I'm not going to say they're going to be watching the bout. They but will be, be, Dan, they will be watching it. No, but the, here's the point, though. Whether they're MMA fans as viewers or not, the point is this. They're all going to be paying in detail uh, attention to how it is regulated, how it is run, what the outcome is, and to see, you know, this is, this is, the, this is the guinea pig. Because the way you, you do a, a MMA event in terms of housing fighters, transporting fighters, doing testing fighters, having referees, having regulators, having staff, it's that is all exactly the same as the way a boxing event would be run. The only thing that's different is the way that the combat is conducted within the confines of their octagon or in the case of boxing. So they all want to see how does this play out? Are they able to do the test properly? Are they able to keep people within the bubble for a certain period of time, whether it's the, the actual boxers, their, their trainers and teams, the, the regulators, the referees, judges, and all the people that go along with an event, because as you know, you know, people think, oh, you can just put a boxing event on behind closed door. You just need a boxer, a referee, and, you know, some judges and, you know, a couple other people in the corner. The reality is you also need all the broadcasters and a number of other support staff. My estimation and talking to other people within the business is that you cannot mount a boxing event. Even if you're only doing a smaller card, let's say Top Rank and some of the other companies have talked about doing events where they have fewer number of fights, you know, as opposed to with a, a you know, an eight or a 10 fight card, maybe limiting it to like four or five fights. But even if you limit it to four or five fights, you can't do one of these events um, conservatively for less than 100 people involved, probably right. even a little more. So they're all paying attention to see how is UFC going to be able to pull this off uh, in terms of their broadcast. And also, frankly, how does the product look on television? How does it come off? All there's another, things, there's, enough, there's another issue underlying that, which is beyond what is normally our remit, which there's two words, corporate manslaughter, okay? And they're, they're horrible words. So there's another issue going on about the risk involved, the precautions right. being taken. Like, God forbid anyone dies of COVID who's involved in any of these three sure. events. So there's, that's, you know, in the kind of work that we do, that's another whole story as well. We know when there's been lack of duty of care for heavyweights in New York. You wrote brilliantly on the story about the heavyweight at the time. I followed your coverage. I wrote about it a little myself. You know, the Eastern European heavyweight that yeah, was left not, uh, trying to was, find a fucking taxi to get to yeah, hospital because of his brain damage. Magomed Abdesalamov. Who exactly. I know you covered the story in detail. I, yeah. As you know, I read your stuff, you read mine. You know, I did a little Listen, bit. the New York State Commission they clearly were negligent because they, they were. But that's what I'm saying, Dan. All I'm saying is that underneath the surface here, fans of boxing and fight sports are going to be delighted. Listen, I can't wait for it tomorrow night. I've got a three hour radio show and then I'm going to be tweeting and texting and writing and drinking, all drinking or whatever it is <laughs> through the night. <laughs> Fuck off. Um, you know, and covering it. And I hope it's a success. I don't want it to fail. You know, I don't want anyone to be ill. But the truth is, let's say there's 24 fighters on this first card, 72 in all. Let's say one of them gets COVID and dies. And I hope it doesn't happen. He leaves a wife with a 
a three-year-old and a four-year-old child, who picks up the, the, the insurance bill on that? Do you know what I mean? To secure yeah. those people for the rest of their lives. To, so, you know, it's a bit like soccer players coming back now and saying, my wife has extreme a- asthma. I'm really worried about playing football again. Because, or and soccer. Gareth, at, at this point, though, you know, the athletes, yes, they, they need a check. They want to compete. They don't want to waste the training. I understand that they have, this is their job to do. But they have to be aware that there's a risk. And if they're willing to take it, again, I don't want anything bad to happen to any of these guys or gals, uh, MMA or boxing or any athlete for that matter. But they have to weigh the risks and the rewards. And if they choose to go through with it and something bad happens, I mean, it'd be, it'd be terrible, obviously, and you'd feel bad about it. But, you know, I'm pretty sure that they're all clearly aware that there's a risk involved. The same way, by the way, even if everything was, was normal and there was no pandemic, the same way there's a risk just getting into the ring. There is it. There are inherent there are inherent risks in our sport. It's a this bit may like, be one that is not totally necessary to take. Yeah. Again, it's their it's their it's their choice to do so. So you know, I'd say best of luck to everybody. Well, one of the things I'd like to embark on you in future shows as we roll this down now and close this out is my research recently in the last two or three days, last seventy two hours. I've spoken to the Hearns and the Warrens and the Arams. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the the the, the, the not the Alibis, but PBC. All I've spoken to the big organisations, the DeBellas, the Oscar De La Hoyas. I've been working in the last few days talking to the small hole promoters. And there are some fighters that need to fight to pay their mortgages and feed their little kids. Sure. But you mentioned it at the top of the show. On Sunday, our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, and I know this as a journalist, because I know what happens in the news and I've been around a long time. Um, We are gonna be encouraged to go back to work. Retail, the city, finances, manufacturing, because it can't go on forever. Because- you're right about that, but I don't think- But but let me finish then. No, let me just finish. doesn't give a damn if you live or I live. They don't care. They want the economy open. They're not interested in whether we live let me let. But what I was gonna say was, People will be encouraged to go back to work, but it will be at their own risk. True. So they will say on Sunday here, if you can do your job from home, do it from home. If you can minimize the risks, minimize them. I have underlying, I don't, I feel very strong as a person, as a physical being, but I don't want to go to a fight unless it's absolutely necessary right now. Well, right now, you and I, we can do our work from our homes. Correct. To my knowledge, and I, I don't know this 100%, I don't think that they're allowing journalists into that MMA event. Again, no, that they, they are. They're, they're, no, they're in a building outside. Okay, so don't have trouble. Really our, our old either. pal, Kevin Ioli, who invented boxing, didn't he? Kevin invented <laughs> boxing. Um, well, I think he invented it before you invented it, before I invented it. Anyway, no, Kevin's there. Um, I think the ESPN journalists are there. I think John Morgan, who's like the press association for an MMA junkie. I'm just saying there are a number of people that write. But they're behind screens, you know? I mean, it's not quite the same. I mean, and to use one example, there was a couple of years ago, there was a fight I went to in California at... Uh, the, what was then the StubHub Center, now the Dignity Health Park. Uh, it was Oscar Valdez against Scott Quigg. Uh, you know, you're, you're a British countryman. Anyway. Yeah. I was there as well. well. Hey, it was pissing with rain. Don't you remember? Exactly. So it was in an open tennis court, pissing with rain. So we covered the fight watching on a screen underneath the stadium. I mean, as, as, a, as a friend of mine said, you flew 3,000 miles to watch a fight in a, you know, in basically a bunker down underneath the stadium. What are you going to do? You couldn't do work at rinks. But anyway, it's the same sort of thing. You're there, yes, but you're not really there because you're not at ringside uh, or cage side. So it is maybe you'll be able to talk to the fighters and, uh, and the promoters and that sort of stuff. But it's, uh, you know, many of the people that do what we do, we can still for the time being do that from our, our homes, uh, whether it's a broadcast, whether it's, uh, you know, writing a story, doing an interview on the telephone or, or via a video, you know, you can still do the job. You know what I'm excited about? I want to I want to hear from some of the questions that we solicited from our people. Oh yeah, right. hang on, hang on a sec. Right, hang on. Right, we got right. a bunch Let's of do this very quickly. There were some good questions I noticed. Were it's like, there? Uh, it's okay, like a Friday chat, but instead of in the written word, it's the you and I talking about it on a video. All right, here we go. I'm going to fire away. 
I want okay. these rapid, Dano. I want the oh, I that's his boy, yeah? Okay, okay. Do you see Broner fighting in 2020? No. Me, no. Who would be Lomachenko's first opponent when he returns to 130? I'd like to see Mikey Garcia get back down to lightweight. Well, that would mean he'd have to go from uh, welterweight down to 130. I don't, you know, I don't think Lomachenko has made any announcement that he's going down to 130. He's supposed to fight Tiafima Lopez in a unification at 135. I think that's the fight that's still in the works and still the plan. Uh, it may take a little while to get that off the ground. We've got to see how these closed-door fights go, but I, I'm, that's the fight to me. Bernard Donaldson asks us, what's your thoughts on Holyfield and Tyson making comeback, uh, uh, making comebacks, albeit for exhibitions? We've answered that already, Bernard, but I want to give you a, a shout-out. Ryan O'Hara, this is a good one. What are your oh, thoughts Ryan, on Ivan Ditchko? Huh? I say Ryan, if it's Ryan O'Hara, I think it is. That's our, our, uh, our pal who writes now for uh, the Ring Magazine website. Oh, yeah, Ryan, of course. Ryan O'Hara says, and I'll answer this first. What are your thoughts on Ivan Ditchko and where do you see him amongst the heavyweights in a couple of years? Now, I remember Ivan from the London 2012 Olympics, um, brilliant Eastern European fighter. That area of the world has produced some great heavyweights. He's tall, angular, awkward, he can fight. And I see him up there if they progress him right. Well, I'll say to Ryan, likes to remind me when I see him at fights that he used to read me when he was in like high school or junior high school. So he likes to make me feel old. Uh, but on to the question. Look, I think that <laughs> is, <laughs> he is probably not in that A-level group of, of the up and coming heavyweights, like, like the Daniel Dubois, like, uh, you know, a Philip Hergovic and some of the other guys that were in that same amateur class or, you know, in, in the case of uh, Hergovic fought in the Olympic games, but he's maybe just a, a little bit below that. He also uh, probably, maybe I haven't seen lately, but I don't think he's been as active as some of those other guys also. Doesn't have that huge push behind him, but he, he's, he's a big, strong heavyweight, like you said. Looks like he can punch him. But I've seen him on American TV once or twice. He fought on, I think, uh, some undercards that Roy Jones Jr. promoted. And, uh, you know, he's a prospect. He's tough, yeah. definitely. Dan, you're wearing out my startup disc. We need to move on, yeah? Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next question. Next question. Arguably, Triple G should currently be 42-0. and 0. Or at least 41 0 and 1. No, 41 1 and 0. I'm sorry, mate. He lost the second fight. And Dan, I know Dan agrees. I scored, no, no. I scored the second fight a draw. Okay, it's, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. The word is over. Where are my startup disc, yeah? Um, okay, after okay. his bounce with Canelo, how do you see a third and final fight versus Canelo going at this stage? Uh, I've had massive Triple G discussion on, on Twitter uh, recently because I have stated things that I say he's an all-time great middleweight. He's one of the all-time great punchers. He'll be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, to me, people don't, people don't give him the respect he deserves in many ways. Uh, that said, in a third fight with Canelo at this stage of their careers in the real world that we live in, it's hard to pick against Canelo at this stage. But Triple G still might have one great fight uh, in that sense left in him in the uh, you know, I'll welcome it if they can get that deal done. I don't agree with you. Canelo will stop him in the third fight. Final Who's question. Stopping? Well, if stop him? Friend. I mean, hold on, hold on, hold on, time out. Triple G, never been down, never been really... You'll stop him, Dan. Uh, that's my theory. That's fine. Listen, the last one comes from our old friend, friend Stur Fred Sternberg, Manny Pacquiao's PR guy, Golovkin's PR guy. Hey, Fred, go do one, yeah? And here's his message. And I'm telling you, because you don't insult my mate during a podcast or a vodcast. Are you referencing today's taping of the boxing hashtag boxing video chat with the, the Sprite guzzler, Dan Raphael ESPN, and Gareth A. Davis? Did, hey, hey, Fred, go do one, you motherfucker. Fred, right here, baby. Yeah, exactly. Listen, we'll answer any other questions on Monday or Tuesday next week. I love you very much, Dan. It's always great chatting to you, mate. Same here, and uh, go easy on the drink at your, uh, at your party this afternoon. I'm so, sipping. Sipping, sip. Don't guzzle. Like you guzzle the Sprite, sip. <laughs> See you later. All right, man, have a great weekend.